and Romanian, and I was born in Czechoslovakia in Europe. I had a father, mother, grandparents, and I had a little brother. I had a lot of friends, but most of my friends weren't Jewish, but I'm Jewish. So when the Nazis occupied my country, they made the Jewish people to wear a yellow star on every clothing. Even, even the people who would put it on a safety pin, the Nazis would check it, and then they would beat them up or send them to jail or kill them. So every clothing we had had to put on a brick to sew on a yellow star. If not, we would be beaten to death. And after that, my friends, the one who I played with and went to school with, they would turn away from me and they wouldn't want to play with me no more because I wore a yellow star. And even today, after so many years, it's still painful for me to remember that all my friends just turned away from me just because I had to wear a yellow star. And you know, it's so many years and I still remember it like today. It's still painful for me to remember how they turned away from me. Now I'm gonna tell you my biography and then I, you're gonna watch a documentary. And when you see the documentary, make sure you see there are gonna be big pits and Anne Frank and her sister are buried there today too, they are there. And, and after that, any questions you have, I'll be happy to answer. My name is Hilda Mantelmaker. I was born in Czechoslovakia. Because I'm Jewish, I was forced out of my country. The Nazis killed my parents, my grandparents, and my little brother. I'm here today, and I would like to share my personal Holocaust experience. I hope what I went through, no one else would ever have to go through. When you hear my personal Holocaust experience, I was only a little girl. Jewish people have always been a tiny minority struggling to survive in every country where they live. In Germany, many Germans never admitted their defeat in World War I and they bring it at the Jews. Hitler was a dictator. He came to power in Germany in 1933. He unleashed the Nazi nightmare of brutality on the whole world. The Nazis began their destruction with the Jews. The uniqueness of position of Jews in Nazi world was they had been singled out for total destruction. The only way of avoiding the death sentence was not to have been born Jewish. Jews couldn't go to concerts, beaches, theaters, museums, or even walk the sidewalks. I told my mother it wasn't fair because everything belongs to God. My mother said the Nazis did like Jews. I asked my mother, why was I born Jewish anyway? My mother said, God chose the religion we are born into. I certainly would not deny any of God's creation. Jews were forbidden to go to school, couldn't have stores, Jewish doctors, dentists, lawyers, but official warning posted at the door. A Jew visitor prohibited. Synagogues were destroyed. All Jewish property was looted and the Nazis burned all the books written by Jewish writers. As of January 1, 1939, all Jews had to carry an identification card and wear a yellow star, which marked us along as an outcast. On the eve of World War II, January 1939, Hitler said, I'll kill all the Jewish race throughout Europe. Those Jews came to Berlagade as enemy number one, and the murder of the Jews became one of the aims for which the war was being waged. It could not have been made more clear that the Nazi government was determined to destroy Jewish people both physically and morally. We were buried on our streets and invaded in our homes. We were tortured, imprisoned, and murdered. All my Christian friends were not allowed to sit next to me in school just because I was Jewish. They moved away from me like I had developed a plague overnight. These kids were my friend yesterday, but today, because I was forced to wear a yellow star, they called me dirty Jew and yelled obscenities. I screamed and get the police. They left. What police are you going to tell? If the police gets 
some Jews getting beat up. When I was a little girl, the police, my parents had a restaurant, and the police would come in, and my father would always give them free drinks, and my mother would always give them free food, and they would always play with me and my little brother. But when the Nazis struck upon my country, they didn't even know us, they didn't even look at us. I started to run home as fast as I could. The Nazis were looking for girls and women every night. My father put bars on all windows of our bedroom so the Nazis couldn't get in. Instead, the Nazis broke the window and set fire to our dregs. My father also made a ship ticket for hiding us. So we were always listening to their footsteps. Nazi boots approaching our house. Then we quickly run and hide. There were giant rats in the shed, but we girls would have rather died in the dark with the rats than being raped by the Nazis. We huddled together like frightened little animals and prayed that the Nazis wouldn't find us. We have the choice either turn bitter through our experience or come closer to God. My parents were very, very orthodox and prayed Friday night, Saturdays, and holidays. But now my parents were constantly praying in the temple. Life after that night became a nightmare. Or chances for an undisturbed sleep for sleep. Who knew the Nazis would be back again? After all, who would bother to stop them? We had a curfew and could not leave our homes. We had to be packed and ready for the Nazis. We waited days and nights knock on the door. We knew we could only bring with us what we could carry and what I had done. I spent my days roaming in the house that was full with suitcases. I wasn't allowed to play with my friends. Ghettos were set up, isolating all the Jewish population behind barbed wire. Ghettos suffered from overcrowding, hunger, no fuel for cooking. Ghetto life was difficult and degrading. When the Nazis came for us, they took my mother's wedding drink and my earrings out of my ears. The most terrible thing that happened when I saw my father cry. My parents were married for many, many years and my mother had never taken off her wedding ring. I still feel the painful memory daily and still frightens me. While I was walking to the ghetto, I felt so ashamed because the friends, the one I went to school with and played with, watched me carry a bigger package than myself. The ghetto was established at the former brick factory. It could have perhaps housed 2,000 people, yet 14,000 people were made to live inside. Six families lived in one room without furniture and only floor of cement. There were no bathrooms, so we had to improvise something that an awful, depressing, and demoralizing effect on us. They took us out to work, gathered all the Jewish property that was left behind, and after making us so the road, the Nazis sent all property to their own families to Germany. The Nazis always escorted us. While I worked, my Christian friends played on the street and spared us. We were then taken from the ghetto in Czechoslovakia. Then, when the ghetto crack arrived, ghetto car arrived, they push you in, and they push you in, and if you sit down, you have to sit at the same place three days and three nights. And if they push you in and you stood, there was no room to sit, you had to stand for three days, three nights without moving, you had no room. They put a, a, a big dish to go in the bathroom, but no one could move. So we, everybody just relieved themselves where they were standing. And the cattle car became like a sewer. When they locked the cattle cart from outside, people started screaming. A lot of people lost their minds right away. Many people were dead and arrived in Auschwitz. When we arrived in Auschwitz, it was very well organized. When you entered Auschwitz, it was a big work of sign. Lots of happy music at the entrance. Dr. Mengele, who was called the Angel of Death, was a tall man who looked slim and fit in his spotless uniform. He chose to live or die. He greeted us with big German shepherd dogs. Dr. Mengele had a crude face and carried a whip in his hands. The whip moved sometimes to the left, sometimes to the right, and sometimes to the left. If he whipped to the left side,
you die immediately. You are sent to the gas chambers. And if you move to the right side, you live in torment a little longer for the slavery than for the Nazis. None of us had the slightest idea of the sinister meaning behind the pointing, not to the right and not to the left, but far more frequently to the left. The left meant you were sentenced to die and forced to enter a shower, which were actually gas chambers. They were given a piece of soap and a towel, and as his officer told them, breathe deeply. He said it would help their lungs stay healthy, but it infected them and prevented them from getting sick. Within a short time, only their ashes would remain. When we arrived, any person who couldn't jump wasn't healthy enough to jump. They were killed or taken and put in an ambulance, and on the ambulance was painted a red cross, pretending that's a red cross, and they're gonna be taken somewhere in a hospital, but they were taken straight to the gas chambers. When we as people got in Auschwitz before us, they would say, the only way out of Auschwitz is up the chimney. First the gas chambers, then the crematorium. Generally, those fit for hard labor, but I think a Dr. Mengele had selection for forced labor, starvation, cold, inadequate sanitary condition, disease and cruel treatment. Finally, liquidating too. Dr. Mengele came to the cattle car and he asked who has twin children. And he said, he introduced himself as a doctor. So we were brought up, the doctors help us. So the parents gave the twin children to Dr. Mengele because he would wash them because we, they, we were all dirty and hungry. And so the parents thought I'd give to Dr. Mengele so he could take care of them. So Dr. Mengele put the parents in the gas chambers and he selected the children, the twin children, and used them for gruesome, painful medical experiment. I had been stripped naked and I was so embarrassed. My cheeks got hot because the Nazis were watching me. I felt so degraded. I tried to cover my naked body with my arm, but the Nazis shook me, dragged me, slapped me until I saw stars. Then he said, you are here to obey, listen to orders, or you'll end up in smoke. I learned very fast that I was to do exactly what I was told without questioning. I learned what fear is. The Nazis smashed me through a tray of swelling disinfectant. I was issued one of the potato sack dresses. As a final indignity, my head was shaved. They took everything away from us. We had no calendars, not even a picture of our parents. No mirrors, but we could feel our degradation. No undergarments to wear, no, no socks, only wooden clocks on our feet. They made me blisters, yet I had to march in them. The blisters were open and hurt to walk on them. We had no medicine or bandages. I still could feel the pain today. One girl tried to sit down because her feet were sore. The guards clapped her on her head and screamed, march faster. The blisters on my feet burned like fire. I beat my lips from pain and march. I prayed and wished God would come and help me. The road is full of sharp pebbles. I'm afraid of limping because I don't want to die. I was separated from my parents, my grandparents, and my little brother, and without a word they disappeared, and I never, never, ever saw them again. My parents fundamentally, incapable of hate or violence, in love with life, were exterminated in Auschwitz crematorium. I don't even have a grave to weep on. Or oh, let's not get out of the cattle truck. My mother said, most people are good. We will work hard and no one will ever hurt us. She said after seeing people who took poison because they just couldn't stand the suffering, they just hugged and died in each other's arms. Some older people and babies died from heat and thirst. If I couldn't believe today that my parents, my grandparents, my little brother are in heaven, I couldn't go on. I see them every day. I know they have to be in heaven because they had hell on earth. So I know that. My father said, we have to be strong. The German people are so educated, so well behaved, so gentle. They would never ever hurt us. When I was in Auschwitz, I had a girl with me in the same room. Uh, she was brown and blue eyed and she lived on my street 
and she she went to the church every Sunday and we all thought she wasn't Jewish and she was with us so she started crying I'm not Jewish I why am I here I shouldn't be here Dr. Mengele came and she was blind and blue eyed but Dr. Mengele came and put her in the gas chambers that the Dr. Mengele that, that's what he wanted. The whole world in Hitler, the whole world be black and blue eyed. And that's the only people who should be alive. But they, they, have, they have to be perfect too. But they put her in the gas chamber. But her family gave up Jewish religion many, many, many generations back. She had no idea. And I had no idea that she was Jewish till I saw her in Auschwitz. We lived in huge barracks. It was filled with triple-decker bombs. I cried for my parents. Someone said, do not cry. If you want to leave, so I prayed to God quietly and talked to God secretly, but I was told if I cry, they come and take me away. We all got prisoners' numbers. Our name had to be forgotten if we want to leave. Many people got numbers tattooed on their arms. I don't have a tattoo because Nazis hadn't bothered tattooing prisoners they intended to send in the gas chambers. Needed to go to the bathroom, but I could only go when the, when the guards told us to go. The bathroom was a narrow dirt ditch with a board over it that had hundreds and hundreds of holes cut into it. I was so ashamed. I had to sit down on the bathroom. We all had to sit down at the same time and get up at the same time while the Nazis were watching over us. When I and I in Auschwitz, I heard the prayers and screaming of people. If people couldn't jump fast enough of that yellow truck, they were dragged. Sick and old people were dragged out of hospital and nursing homes. If they couldn't walk, they were killed. Many times I saw bodies handed to the electric fence that surrounded us. In Auschwitz, we had a fence, but it was an electric fence. And some people got so depressed and they couldn't stand the suffering they just went to the electric fence and touched, and they died. And just couldn't, they saw what was happening and they couldn't take it. But if a Nazi shoot them before they touched the electric fence, the Nazi would get two weeks vacation with pay and all kind of food and all kind of goodies because he could tell Berlin, the capital of Germany, he could tell them that, that person wanted to run away and he shot them before they ran away. So he got an award. But that wasn't true because he wanted to go to the to the he wanted to die. I thought there were no more people left on the earth because I just couldn't believe that people would just let it happen to us just because we were Jewish and no one stopped the Nazis. Gold did to extract that from all the corpses. And the ashes were used as fertilizers. After the woman's head was shaved, their hair was combed, spun into thread, and mattresses for me. When they cut my hair, they had a bag there, and every piece of hair they cut from, where somebody was older, every, every hair of their body went in the bag. When you, you know, my hair went, and put it in a bag. And they were so watching the piece of hair, because they were sending the hair to Germany, and they made it, they made it pillows and mattresses, and they used it for the Nazis, the boots to keep them warm. During the work goes, the SS men and women who stood guard over us would beat us with a whip and send their dogs on us. Many of my friends had their legs stolen by the dogs and I never saw them again. You know, after so many years, and it's many years, and I see a dog and could be the tiniest dog somebody walked, I get a panic attack. I have to hide or cross the street or something because I cannot see it as a tiny dog. I see it as a German Shepherd dog who tore people apart for any reason. Some people were torn apart because they couldn't speak German and the Nazis would give them an order and they wouldn't do it. Not that they didn't wanna do it, they didn't understand it. So they made the German Shepherd dog to tear them apart. And even so many years today, I I'm still cannot see any dog. When I see the Nazis with suitcases and gold, with gold, I wonder which tip was my mother's. 
not to spray static concentration camp work and assume at least surgically located munition factories and bridges. They, later on, they needed people, so we went in, in Germany, they took us to Germany in the cities and work. Allied forces dropped bombs on us because they want to blow up the bridges. At night, American bombed us during the day. The English bombed us during the night. We built underground shelter for the Nazis, yet we were not allowed to go down to the shelter during the raids. We wondered if the bombers would pass us over or would be there or target tonight, because we never knew if the Nazis, if, if they were gonna be. Well, when, when the bomb came, we were very happy. Even if we died, we'd rather <coughs> die from the bombs than from the Nazis. When the bombs started falling on us, we didn't know if the Nazis won the war. If the Nazis would have been the war, we would none of us survive, none of us. But when the bomb came, we knew the Nazis didn't win the war. So we were happy and we weren't afraid of dying from the bombs because we had to stand outside, but we weren't afraid. I prayed for the pilot's safety, so they continue bombing. I just sat and prayed and waited. Every bomb that exploded filled us with joy and gave us new confidence in life. What the, what the Nazis took over in the shelter by the factories where we were working, we were left standing outside while the bombs fell on us. Many of my friends died, but we weren't afraid of dying because the bombs brought us hope. I worked as a slave laborer, constant pain in my stomach. Hunger was a constant problem. Once a day, they give you a little <coughs> turnip soup. If you stood in the front of the line, you only got a little water. But if you stood end of the line, there was sometimes no soup left over. Also, one time a day, they gave you a little piece of bread made of sawdust and cornstarch. And this little piece had to last the whole day. But most of us gobbled the red bread away. We were always thirsty and hungry. Food and water became most important things in our life. Important things. When we came, in the camps, we told up our parents, grandparents, or families, but later on, we just didn't think of anything but water and bread, water and food. That's all we were dreaming all the time. We thought of little else than our need for water and food. We tried to remember how food and water taste. They said, I were transporting materials in factories and lorries we had to push. We unloaded wagons, heavy, heavy cement, cement Check, semi check. We had to do anything that men would do. We had to build streets. We had to carry train tracks. Streets of Germany needed bricks. We had to carry them from the barn building. We had to dig ditches. The shovel was bigger than I was. My arms were aching. The German people looked at us while I worked. I wondered if they even cared about all the skeletons. They pretended not to see us. We got used to hundreds of threats, blows, and execution. We got accustomed to seeing people die. The Nazis were always guarding us, yet we had no place to go. We trembled with weakness, knowing all the time that anyone who broke down would be beaten to death. This was the indirect road to death. Life under the constant threat of the smoking chimney was draining out the little strength we had. Those who had become unfit for service were quickly replenished again by fresh deliveries of food. Standing in the pouring rain for three, four hours, waiting for roll call, we went in bed close to bed and woke up next morning in the dark and chilled to the bone and was forced to work again, barely having enough strength to stand. When the Allied soldiers were advancing, the Nazis marched us to Bergen Bethlehem, another concentration camp. I couldn't believe what my eyes saw. The dead had not been removed for days. They had been simply piled up in corners. <coughs> the worst of all was seeing occasional movement about the stuck bodies, finding raised hands looking for lies. I didn't think I could make it one more step. I knew my days were numbered. I saw my girlfriend in the pipe, apparently innocent of everything, but being born Jewish. In Belgium, the girls had no other work, just take away the dead. We were not strong enough to carry the dead bodies, so we dragged them around on the ground. It is very painful for me to remember and to tell my experience in Auschwitz and Bergen as a death camp. 
but to remain silent with their own experience of six million Jewish victims died with them. I was separated in Belgium, Belgium. When I was in Belgium, Belgium, I was liberated by the British. I never felt hate, not even during the war. When the British came closer, the Nazis wanted to hide all their corpses. So they quickly promised us food if we would make big pits and bury the dead people. My strong belief in God sustained me. When first I came, when first I was standing by Auschwitz, by the crematorium and the Aschenberg, and I realized what was happening. I looked up and I thought God wanna come down and I wrote, because my mother used to say that God is everywhere. So I looked up and I was waiting God to come down, but didn't. But God was always with me. I was never alone. God was my defender. Faith kept me going to stay alive one more day, one more hour, one more minute. It was all I hoped for. In Bergen, Bergen, I had typhus fever, transmitted by life in clothing, often fatal. British soldiers buried us and put us on a straw, very gently. We were barely alive. The Holocaust cannot be forgotten. We must never suppress the memories, but instead pass them on to our children. That this inhuman, terrible crime would never ever happen again. We must teach mankind what evil, hatred, and prejudice can do. With seeing so many people suffer, I developed a sense of compassion for all suffering people. There are people today claiming the Holocaust never happened. When I came to this country, when after five years in a DP camp in Germany, I came to this country and I worked and I had neighbors and I made friends and I never mentioned where I came from, what happened, never nobody. And I never wanted to touch it because I didn't think I could handle it. And then one day I was watching television news and news. I don't remember 20, 20 or 60 minutes, one of the news stations. And there was two men who said, the Holocaust never happened. It's, it's a lie, Jewish people make it up. When I saw it, then I knew I had to tell the truth. And if I wouldn't see it, I would have never talked about it. But when I saw this man coming up and saying that, then I knew I have to tell the truth. And that's when I started talking about it. If everybody could be made to realize, regardless of color, race, religion, people behave in basically the same way. We all have the same emotions, joys, and sorrows. The prejudice would have no place on this world. I hope and wish every prayer for every child to grow up and peace with hunger and prejudice. To remember means open our soul and make us more sensitive to suffering everywhere and to injustice everywhere and to the victims of humiliation everywhere. To forget means side with the killers. It means to offer them a posthumous victory. But, but I must not do this betray the dead I left behind or who left me behind. They were killed once. They must not be killed again through my forgetfulness. I must end by telling you that I thank God every day that I'm so fortunate to be in the best country in the world, United States of America. And I hope you all know that you're lucky being in this country because that's the best place to be. It is good to be free. My life in Auschwitz and Bergen by then to this day seem very unreal to me. As long as I'm able, I will continue speaking to students about the Holocaust. As long as God gave me my health and my strength. Six million Jews were killed. God wanted me to survive so I could speak for those voices who have been forever silent. And I will continue trying to tell the story. I know I'm very, very lucky that faith in God was always in me. I was blessed from my parents instead faith in me. Now, I'm, I, I'm gonna show you the documentary now, and then you could ask me all the questions after the documentary. Okay, thank you. Now, if you have any questions, I'm going to take them and relay them. Put your hand up. What were the bombs that night in Germany? Like, who was saying the bombs? Well, 
what were the bombs that you were mentioning that were falling? What was the bomb? The, the, the war was still on. So they wanted to, we wanted to win the war. So that was the bomb. The British and American bombed to liberate the Nazis from the Nazis. So that was the bomb. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was curious, um, it sounded like your feet were uh, very damaged, especially during the march. I was wondering um, how long it took for, your, for you to physically recover from your time in the, uh, in the yeah. death camps and in the marches. Yeah. And how long it took me? I really don't know time that much, but uh, I got typhus fever in, in Belgium by then. So I was laying in a, in a, on a straw bed for a long time. So it had to be a long time, but I don't know exactly, but I didn't, when I was laying for many, many months sick after I was liberated, so I, I didn't walk. Okay. Thank you. Sure, I can't judge just because some people choose to be evil. I love people, but some people choose to, you know, everybody's born good. And some people choose to stay good and some people choose to be evil. And uh, we shouldn't be not liking the good people. I love a lot of good people. go back nowhere. I could have gone back everywhere because they, I could have free every day I was asked to go back. But I don't want to go back. It just would be too painful for me. So I don't want to go back. I, I am glad some people could go back and they okay, but I can't. What was your life like after liberation? What was uh, her life like after liberation? Neil, oh. what did you? I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you heard it. Uh, what was your life like after liberation? Yeah. What was your life like after liberation? Well, it was hard because I well, <coughs> was better than it was before. I was in a DP camp for five years in Germany, so at least we didn't have to be afraid of being killed and we had food and so it was better but um, you know it takes time till you it takes time till it's all better Tell anybody about the Come closer, I can't hear you, sorry. I want you closer. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I forget what the question is. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, you didn't talk much about your experience. <clears throat> she wants to know the reaction of your friends and other people when you did tell them okay. about Okay, they felt very bad that I never told them. And they felt like I, you know, I didn't, I wasn't honest with them. But I didn't want to talk about it. So I didn't till I had to, till I was forced to talk about it. They, okay, now, in the, when I was in the deep camp for five years, because I was an orphan, we lived together with people. There were men, who lost wives and children in the gas chambers. When we arrived in Auschwitz, when the father held the children, the father went in the gas chambers because children could not survive. If the mother held the child, the mother went in the gas chamber. My mother held my little brother and they went to the gas chambers. So when I was 
in the living <coughs> camp for five years. I lived with men who lost five same children, and I lived with women who lost husbands and children in Auschwitz. And and we then we had some orphans that had lost parents, and we were all together. And if people had some families or some friends somewhere, they <coughs> got a sponsorship, they could leave the camp, the DP camp. But if you had nowhere to go, you had no sponsorship, then you had to stay in the camp. So that's why, you know, so later on, the camp became a little bit easier. But first, we were like, one, probably in one room were 10, 15 people because it was so crowded in the DP camp. But then we were less and less, so it became better, we weren't so crowded. But people married, you know, just married each other because people were alone, they had nobody, people had no families, people lost, lost husband, lost wife, lost children. So they just married, married each other. Even sometimes they couldn't, uh, didn't know nothing about any better, but they married each other because then everybody was alone. I got married in a different camp, and because I was an orphan, I used to get a Hershey bar, and I never knew I was living so close to the Hershey bar either when I got the Hershey bar in the different camp. So because an orphan, and then I got married in Dippy Camp to somebody who came from a different country. He was a survivor also. He suffered a lot. And he, he never could get over the suffering. So that was a problem. But um, I had a daughter. And in Jewish religion, you marry, when you have children, you name them after <coughs> parents or grandparents, somebody that you want to be remembered. So I named, I had a daughter in Germany, in Munich, and I named her Sarah, after my mother. And then when I came to United States, in Rochester, New York, I lived, when I came to United States after five years in Dipikam, I had another daughter, and I named her Hannah, so my grandmother did remember. So I had a Sarah and a Hannah, two daughters. But then when they went to school, I changed Sarah to <coughs> Shirley because Sarah and Hannah is biblical name and I was afraid people were gonna hate them because they know that they're Jewish and gonna hate them and I had no idea that the United States other kids have the same name. So I changed Sarah to Shirley to Shirley Temple. That's all I knew, that's the name I knew. <laughs> and then I had Hannah and I didn't know what, what kind of name, but there was a television <coughs> show at that time, Ozzy and Harriet, but you're too young, you probably didn't see it. And it was Harriet, Ozzy and Harriet. And Ozzy was a husband, was a very good husband, and Harriet had a very good life, so I named her Harriet. So I have a Shirley and a Harriet, and they're both teachers. And Shirley and Harriet today say, Bobby, I wish you wouldn't change my name. I like Sarah and Hannah better, but I wanted to protect them, so I changed their names. I have a lot of bread in the freezer, in the refrigerator. 
and I have a lot of toilet tissue everywhere in the house. That's my birthday and that's my holiday. Every day I get up and I have all these things in the house, it's my celebration. So I celebrate every day. I have toilet tissue, remember I have toilet tissue everywhere, under the bed, over the car, everywhere. <coughs> because I didn't have any, even five years when I was in the, in the TP camp, and United Nations Relief Organization kept the TP camp up. We got, a, we got some food, but we never got toilet tissue. So I know I have so much everywhere. And we didn't have water, we didn't have bread. We, so I have a lot of water, a lot of bread in the house all the time. So every day is my birthday and holiday. That's my holidays too. How did you feel when the British liberated the camp? Did it feel oh, like that? Well, I was, to be true or what? I was typed, I had typed it through that. I was one of the hot, sometimes you could watch the whole documentary. <coughs> I hope you could because it's, it really shows the, you know, the British burned up their hearts because full was full with lies and typhoon. <coughs> and when the British came in, I was on the floor in the hot, laying down and I had dead people under me and dead people over me. And I didn't have any strength because I had typhus driven to push them away. And when they came in, they picked up dead people. And when they picked me up, I made sure they know I'm alive. And I said, it's a miracle. I survived. <coughs> I, was, I never gave up faith. I was always hoping I survived. But some, I didn't think sometimes I will. And when the British came in, I said, I survived. I really, really survived. And it was good. I was happy when they came in. When nobody, okay. Uh, do you mistrust or dislike Germans or Germany today? Uh, he asked if she uh, dislikes or mistrusts Germans as a group. I mistrust Germans. No, because the young people, it's not their fault, but their uh, generation D. And they don't agree with it, and they feel very bad. Most of them, most all of them, the young people feel bad about it. Even Bergen Belsen, you know, the young people made a memorial and the museum, and they really feel bad with the, uh, what, what they have. And, and they, no, it's not their fault, but their, grandparents did, or great grandparents did. It's not their fault, I don't blame them. Mm -mm. They didn't do anything. You see, hatred brings more hatred, and that doesn't do good anybody, all right? So we shouldn't hate. Hate is not good for nobody. Tell them the story about the uh, German kid in the front who wouldn't look at you. Okay, when I went to a high school, I went to a high school and I had quite a many hundred students and one student in the front was sitting and he was blue white a blonde boy and um, graduation was and he wouldn't look at me. And it, you know, I looked at him and I no eye contact and it really bothered me. I said, oh, he must hate me so much he doesn't even want to look at me. And it's, you know, it bothered me why he hates me so much. And then I finished talking and then I went and sit down and the, the young boy gets up and comes to me and he says to me, you hate me. And I said, I hate you. I don't even know you, how could I hate you? He said, you have to hate me because I'm German and when I go visit my family in Germany from my father's side and mother's side, there are pictures on the wall that my grandparents were Nazis, etc. And, 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 and so you have to hate me. Look what happened to you and what happened to your family. And I said to him, I said, why would I hate you? I don't hate you. It's not your fault. And give me a hug. And he gave me a hug and he went away happy and I was happy too. <laughs> I went to a church and I had a lot, a lot of people. And uh, one person got up and he says to me, I do not believe you. After I talked and I told them that, you know, faith kept me going. And he said, I do not believe you that you believe in God. 
he said, I, you know, what happened to you, I don't believe you. And I said to him, why wouldn't you believe it? If not, you know, if not God, none of us would be here today. And, you know, everybody agreed with me, you know. But he, you know, he felt that, uh, he just didn't think I do, but I do. Yeah. about the depictions of the Holocaust in, uh, in films and popular media like uh, Schindler's List and Triumph of the Spirit. But I think about them, I think it's good that people should learn and know about it. So if we don't learn, if, you know, we, do, we should learn so it never happens again. No, I like, especially Schindler's List, he was such a good man. We should have more good people like that. We didn't have enough. He was one of the few that he did, but he saved all these people. We should have more of these people. But thank God there was some that's good too. I take it. I take him. No, it's good. It's good. It's good. People should learn so we be aware what happened, so it doesn't happen again. Because students always ask me, how do we prevent, prevent another Holocaust because I could never go through what you went through. And I said, the only way if we stop <coughs> hating everybody, we shouldn't hate no one. And the, if we stop hating, there are gonna be no Holocaust. But if we hate, that's how, that's how Holocaust starts, with hatred. So we just shouldn't hate. days off 
And he said, for what? Because I didn't get vacation, I didn't get personal day, I didn't get nothing, I just, and so he was surprised, I'm gonna take off two days without pay. He said, why would you take off two days without pay? I said, that's a Jewish holiday. He said, Jewish holiday, why would you take off a Jewish holiday? You're not Jewish, did you marry the Jewish person? I said, no, El, I'm Jewish. He said, no, you, I said, El, I am Jewish. <laughs> and he wouldn't believe me. But anyway, when I went away for two days and I came back, he told everybody I'm Jewish. But I have to tell you, after that, they liked me the same way. Fat, who thought that I should take home the birth, she became my best friend. <laughs> she had a daughter, her name was Christine, and I had the two daughters, and we were friends. You know, they just were ignorant, and that's why they talked. They didn't think they talked, but they became my best friend, and they liked me anyway. So that's the end of the period. Uh, it's almost 2.15, guys. Thank you. Thank you.